Welcome back to the Bitcoin Layer. I'm Nick Batia. Today, we welcome Kelly Lannon. Kelly is a real estate professional. He also writes about Bitcoin. We are bringing Kelly on today to talk about the real estate industry, specifically commercial real estate, multifamily. He has insights on the Taiwanese semiconductor conglomerate that is building a factory in Arizona. And we are pleased to bring on Kelly Lannon. Kelly, thanks for joining us. Well, good morning, Nick. Thank you for having me on. Absolutely. Kelly, let's start with your real estate outlook. Let's uh, talk about what you do specifically in real estate and why you are focused on this motto of survive till 25, as is much of the real estate industry. Sure. So I work at a uh, small development construction firm. We're a ground up development uh, firm. And what we do is uh, buy the land and title it, construct the buildings, lease it and sell it. So we are involved in the process from beginning to end of taking either an old property that gets demolished or a raw piece of land all the way through to somebody living there and eventually selling it. So in the in the business nomenclature, we are merchant builders um, and kind of what that means for us is that given the rate hikes of the last about 18 or so months or two years, rather, um, it's severely impacted the ability for developers such as uh, myself and our family's firm, as well as others to basically do what, you know, do what we do. Um, that plays into the existing housing shortage, as well as the huge glut of properties that's coming through from the post COVID area. And uh, basically the, the funding environment has changed to such a degree that there's so much sand in the gears and the existing projects that are going on have come either to a stop or have been stopped altogether from beginning. Um, so we're kind of in this, this no man's land where you can kind of see the, the light at the end of the tunnel as far as the rate cuts come. And if you can survive to that point, um, then you basically don't go bust. Uh, there's a lot of people, or I guess firms that have taken CRE debt over the last uh, three, four years that basically are maturing in the next, you know, 24 months. So what does that look like for them if they've come in with debt that's, uh, you know, sub 5% interest rate for their expense, and they're going into new debt that's, you know, greater than six or seven or even eight, how does that work for their portfolios? And quite frankly, um, on a project by project basis, usually it doesn't work. So that gets into the question of if the debt's all bad, then where's all the bad debt? And uh, that's the survive till 25. Nobody wants to play their hand. Nobody wants to essentially start getting rid of the marginally bad debt, which affects everybody else's valuations. So it's kind of uh, an all hands on board. Nobody show your cards at the poker table because everybody's afraid of what everybody else is holding is in fact worse than what they're holding. Get up to $100 worth of Bitcoin for free when you sign up with River at river.com slash TBL. River is our Bitcoin exchange of choice, and we love River for two main reasons. Number one, they're Bitcoin only. That means there's no confusion when you go there. And number two, this is really important. River does not use a third-party custodian for Bitcoin storage. That means when you buy Bitcoin with River, that Bitcoin is being held in a multi-signature storage solution by River itself, not by any custodian that might default or lose your coins. Check them out today at river.com slash TBL for that special offer. And this applies to the real estate sector as well as the banks lending to that sector. We're going to unpack that as we go today. We're also mainly curious whether or not this whole commercial real estate issue that we're facing discussing today is going to materialize into a crisis and cause massive write downs at the banking level and the real estate valuation level. That's really what we're curious about and what we're going to be exploring today with Kelly. So Kelly, when you and I sat down in Arizona, we were talking about this whole sand in the gears of the current projects out there. So let's, go to that and talk about the economics of these individual projects and how five plus percent policy rates is affecting the economics on a project by project basis. So they have a debt hurdle to clear. They have economics in terms of their rental income. 
the bank looks at it and decides whether or not to refi. So walk us through what's happening right now. So if you've got a, a ground up construction project, what you're looking at is essentially almost a double in interest rates for your construction. Now, if you were building, like we have projects dating back uh, to 2017 to 2021, where we were kind of at the tail end of those projects going into uh, the increase in rates and as, as well as the increase in expenses from uh, a lot of the uh, money printing. So what you've got is a situation where you bought a project in 2020, 2021, and you're assuming that those rates are going to continue at least for some time. So in your modeling, let's say, you know, if you've got um, a project where you want to build 100 apartments, you buy it in 2020, it's usually going to take you approximately 18 to 24 months just to get to the point where you have construction documents to begin. So um, during that period of time, you're underwriting, you're trying to get bank debt all of these other things. And if you're getting quoted 4% on a construction loan at the time, which was pretty normal, we had multiple projects between uh, four and I think it was like four and a third, where that was a very doable, a very doable project with the rents that you uh, pro forma on the back end. Now, a lot of times the rents are uh, stable. We're in what would be called the Sunbelt region where as people like to say, rents never go down, which is you know, kind of like prices never go down, not really true. But the idea is that you are able to, to, to underwrite and pro forma a project on a stable assumptions. So what happens with rate hikes is that when they go from zero to five, you know, five and a half, is that you get a new price. Now, the new price is not necessarily based on the Fed funds rate explicitly. It's more so based on what's now known as SOFR. And then the banks usually will quote SOFR plus whatever their basis point spread is, you know, that they need to keep their doors open. So for example, it may be somewhere between three to 400 BIPs on top of SOFR. So you've got an effective interest rate on your construction loan somewhere between, uh, what's that, eight and a half to nine and a half percent. So going from, you know, 4% when you, when you buy the deal to going into eight and a half to nine and a half percent when you actually want to build the deal totally crushes your ability to even begin construction. Now, in addition to that, because of, I guess, in the wake of SVB of March 23, uh, all of those sorts of happenings is that banks have essentially reeled in all of their capital for um, for commercial real estate loans, whether it's in construction or even financing existing product. So we have uh, friends and family, or I guess anecdotal ev evidence that if you are just trying to buy, if I wanted to buy a 25 unit multifamily project today, I would have a difficult time getting financing. And you have to remember this, you know, this is what we do for a living. Um, we've been doing this for almost 40 years. So we, we know everybody and it's, it's not a fact about who, you know, it's just a fact that because of what happened, you know, in 23, that essentially the money flow has stopped. So banks are concerned about the existing debt that they have for CRE on top of uh, the BTFP program, any bonds that they may have underwater. And um, so essentially what they're forced to do is to reel in their, their credit committees and limit it to it's essentially just exceptional deals. So uh, if you are a smaller shop like us or you're a mid-sized shop, then the loan covenants get much more difficult to work with. So for example, a lot of the... Uh, a lot of the projects that we work with are sub million, uh, sub ten million in uh, construction debt itself. So the project's worth more than ten, but they'll give you up to ten for kind of what we do. So in that sense, the loan covenants have become incredibly restrictive, uh, in that the the interest rate itself, so so for plus three hundred, and then it's uh, essentially you've got to put additional deposits with the bank. Now this isn't you know, saying, hey, we'll give you this loan if you open up a couple of accounts with us and, you know, if they're operating or maybe, you know, you have one of your other entities come over here. You know, th this is you give us, you know, 25 percent of the loan balance and we put it in essentially an untouchable savings account until you get your certificate of occupancy. So for a shop that's been around like us for a while, it harkens back to the RTC days where a lot of the so uh, savings and loans in institutions were providing loans to clients 
as long as they had funds at the bank. And when that uh, stopped working out so well, a lot of times the savings and loans would confiscate the deposits in order to uh, pay down the debt for the existing loan. So it's a very it's a very tenuous situation, especially for operators who have been around for a long time, because it looks just like what's happening or excuse me, what's happening now looks just like what happened in the late 80s, early 90s, as far as some of those concerns go. So, um, you know, I like to say in the when I read these these uh, these loan offer uh, loan offerings for some of our projects at the very bottom, very bottom of the page and very, very fine print, it says that this is a terrible loan for you if you take this because you are taking all of the risk. Now, in a typical in a typical construction loan, let's say that you get 65% leverage and you're required to put up 35% equity. Essentially, with the cost of the loan itself, um, the fees, all of these things that kind of get thrown in, plus the deposit requirements, you essentially have a reverse situation where you get 35% leverage and you have to come up with 65% of the equity. So, you know, for for... I guess an industry that requires leverage in order to properly produce, you know, uh, sufficient returns for people to take the risk. You just can't do anything. You just end up sitting on your hands because it totally crushes your return. Um, now, this also plays for existing products. So if you have, you know, let's say 100 apartments and you want to refinance it and you're uh, one of the borrowers that's taken, you know, you're one of the 80 billion in borrowers that's taken out debt you know, in 2021, and you had a adjustable rate that comes, you know, fully amortizing this year or the next year, you know, and rents are coming down, how do you how do you show that you can refinance that? And the only answer is that you've got to come up with more equity, or you got to sell it for whatever you're into it for. Um, so we've been seeing a lot more of the latter, at least locally in Phoenix, uh, I kind of track that as a little hobby just to see, you know, how 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 poorly some of the funds from out of town were doing when they were basically coming to, a, you know, the Phoenician gold rush of everybody coming here from California or wherever, you know, in the, the COVID era kind of, um, you know, transcontinental foot movement of people. So uh, you're, you're really in a situation where your, your debt expense is going to double your rental, your rental income is down. And now you have a debt load, which for a lot of these people, they took, you know, max leverage somewhere between 70 and 80 percent, where your equity, when you go to refinance, is totally wiped out. So in order to refinance, you've got to come up with more. So you've got another capital call or you've got to sell. Um, it's really tough. It's a really tough sell when you've got to come up with more equity when you've already lost it all. But it's even tougher sale saying, well, we're just going to walk away from it. So um, I would guess that, you know, while nobody has a crystal ball of what everybody's doing because nobody's telling anybody how bad their books are, um, at least from the banking perspective, what their mark to market on their CRE debt is actually worth, what the buildings are actually worth. Um, I've been seeing a lot more uh, basically groups and investment uh, companies walk away from their existing equity and just say no thanks. Um, so... You know, that, that's that's kind of the math that we're looking at. Um, one other thing that I'd like to touch on is that with COVID era monetary printing and the policies that were pursued, you know, there's huge amounts of cash that were thrown into hot sectors like multifamily. Um, so when these kind of uh, demand surges come through the market, uh, prices of materials go up because demand is higher. But then you also have supply chain issues. So whoever actually can get the materials to you charges a premium on top of that. So we experienced this with one of our projects where we had to build out the last building during this period of time. And instead of, you know, for rough math, instead of that building costing 20 percent of the project, it ended up costing somewhere around 35 percent of the overall expense. So nearly double the cost to finish a single building just because you're chasing materials, labor all of these other things during, um, you know, an expansion of uh, monetary supply. So unfortunately, that has not really abated. Um, some some materials like lumber have definitely come down from their highs and are hovering about where they were beforehand. And I think it's somewhere between four or five hundred, um, a thousand board feet. So 
that's good. But a lot of the other expenses that we have um, have not come down at all. So on top of an increase in cost of the debt, you've got about a 20% increase in the cost just to build the thing. And then on the back end, your rents are also down. Um, it's not significantly in Phoenix. It's about 5% from last year. So um, still, you know, when you're, when you're working with a leveraged, um, when you're working with a leveraged product, such as real estate, 5% goes a long, long ways on the back end of your valuation. So uh, when these projects are trading at a five cap, you know, that's, that's 20 times your rent on the back end of the valuation of your building. So there's a, there's a lot of numbers that don't look really good right now. There's a lot of hope that um, kind of, you, as you discussed, that, you know, in July, we'll see maybe one rate cut. And that's kind of like, you know, the slight relief and pressure where it's like, okay, maybe all of this won't blow up spectacularly. And then, uh, you know, early Q1 of next year, we're looking for, you know, at least a, a hundred basis points and cuts. So will that be enough? Everybody is really, really hoping so. Um, and the survive till 25 dynamic is, okay, we know all of this math does not work right now. We've shelved the majority of our projects and our existing stuff is basically in hot water. Can we get the banks to work with us? And for the most part, we think that they are working with them, whether that's giving some slight forgiveness in the loans or just giving extensions um, just to kind of uh, uh, just to make it. So the, the term in that case is called extend and pretend. So you you extend the, the deal, hoping that, you know, pretending that it's going to get better in the future. Um, so that's kind of, you know, where that market is at. Everybody's really really just kind of looking around hoping that you know the fed starts to cut rates because the industry itself is so dependent on uh leverage in order to make their returns which is dependent on how much does the debt cost so when it goes up nobody's having a good time when cap rates are compressing then everybody's you know buying boats so that's that's what we're looking at okay kelly so there's so much to unpack i want to talk first about the asset side of the bank's balance sheets when they're looking at these projects. So you mentioned that these banks are going to either face, well, let's say they have to refinance these loans. Okay. And they're looking at how to finance the loans uh, of projects where the income is falling. Okay. So, if the bank is looking at the project and they say you don't have the economics to for us to roll this loan and unless you put up another 30 percent in equity and the operator says i can't do that now the operator has a choice to walk away or not but the bank has an influence in that resolution as you discussed so what Walk us through the like that example and how you see that kind of thing playing out. And if you are witnessing that type of activity right now in Arizona banks. So you, I, I suppose as a bank, you have multiple options. So I, I would narrow it down to three. The first option is the extend and pretend. You say, I know, or we, you know, I know that you know that we all know that the project cannot support this debt based on the existing loan covenants. So do we extend your interest only period for two years? Do you think you can survive till then? And then it, that's the yes or no. Then you're arguing about whether or not you think that rents will continue declining and that the future two years will be able to pay, you know, your, your renegotiated debt. The second option is, well, if we, if we chop off some of the debt, on the back end and reduce your load, you know, we'll, the bank will take a haircut for 20% as long as you just keep paying. So therefore, excuse me, your payment will also come down approximately 20%. Is that something that you can do? So um, the third option would be, you know, it would be, sorry, um, we're going to foreclose and this is just the way it's gonna be. We think that we can go to market with this project at a foreclosure and get our money back. We can be made whole. Um, I guess particularly they, there may be 
well, I get the, the, the fourth option would be that the operator does what's called key mail and they mail you the keys as the bank. I don't think necessarily that's going to happen. I think that the banks, um, I think that the banks are in enough trouble that they're not really going to uh, ratchet up the pressure on operators to basically, you know, uh, kind of like a put up or shut up situation. I don't think that they're in the negotiation position to do that. I don't think that they're in the balance sheet position, uh, position to do that. Um, this kind of leads into like the loan loss reserves. Do the banks have enough loan loss reserves in order to start kind of making these pushes? Um, I, I don't really think so. So what we've been seeing is that uh, basically projects have been selling for the previous debt load. So there's a good example um, in Tempe, Arizona, which in this case, it's I think it was about a mile and a half from downtown Tempe, which is basically the north uh, northwest corner of Arizona State University. A uh, group bought the project for $160 million in uh, uh, July of 2022. And in January of 2024, just two months ago, they sold the property for a couple million dollars above the debt. So they bought it for $160 million. They had $108 million in debt. And then they just sold it for $112. And there's a new debt amount of, I think it was like $67 million. So... A lot of the projects that I've been following, some of the smaller stuff that I like to do, uh, is basically just selling for the debt. And whether or not it cash flows at that, I don't, I'm not sure. I know that there a few have been assumptions. Now, the others have been outright sales to pay off the debt, and then the new buyer gets new debt. Um, so it's kind of a mixed bag. I have seen very few foreclosures. I know... Um, Barry Sternlich was on TV the other day saying that foreclosures are up 17%, but foreclosures were so low to begin with that, you know, even if their double digit percentage increases, you know, going from 10 to 12 foreclosures is 20%, but it's, you know, materially it's two new foreclosures. I'm not saying that's what the numbers are, but that's in effect what's going on. Um, so, you know, there's always going to be bad deals to begin with in general. Uh, you've seen a lot of the, I guess the, the Doomer, the Doomer real estate stuff that you can kind of see on Twitter as far as CRE, CRE and especially office sales is that, you know, offices are selling for like two bucks a foot or eight bucks a foot. Now, it's a lot more complicated than that because there's leases involved and all sorts of other uh, contractual obligations that come with the building. Uh, you could you uh, could include TIs or expiring leases and all this stuff. So it, it's a little bit more complicated, but at the same time, those kind of deals are always going to exist and always going to uh, you know, whether they fail or get passed off, that kind of stuff happens. Um, the multifamily space is a little bit different because it's a, it's a much, as far as, you know, the risk curve of commercial real estate goes, multifamily is considered the safest. So there's going to be a lot more demand, a lot more focus on, you know, picking up deals, scooping up deals, and there'll be a lot more competition for those deals. So, um, that's kind of what I've been seeing. And, uh, I think some of the numbers, I know the numbers locally have been showing that. And especially with my time spent contacting people, my, my, I like to say my hobby is calling banks and asking for the REO manager to see if he's got any paper on his desk yet. And the answer has always been no. It's been no for 18 months. So um, there's not, there's not a whole lot coming down the pipeline where banks are, you know, turning the thumb screws on anybody to, to take back property. Okay. So, Let's get into a couple charts here, and then I have I have several more follow ups. Um, quickly for us, this chart number two, surviving the debt maturities of commercial real estate. We see a very large notional amount for this year, twenty twenty four. Then it drops significantly. So, just summarize for us uh, your concern here with this number. So, the, the large concern about this number is that most of these. Uh, approximately 80 billion of this 210 billion is debt that was taken on in 2021. So this is very short-term commercial debt that was taken when interest rates uh, for the debt load were very low and now they've approximately doubled. So the question is, who's going to absorb this? Is it going to be the banks that are going to absorb this loss? Or are they going to be able to get rid of it on the market without absorbing any loss or at you know, at worst, minimal losses. So the question is, who took these loans? Where are they? Uh, how much Dutch are they really in? And how 
are we going to get rid of, or how are we going to get rid of them without uh, hurting ourselves or everybody else around us? Okay. So Kelly, I recently had a conversation with an individual who works at a very large private bank. So it's one of the, the, the bulge brackets. Let's just say it. Uh, this is a friend that works at JP Morgan private bank. Okay. And this friend told me that deals are coming. Basically they have clients that have real estate holdings and uh, have real estate projects. They have debt against it. And they're coming with these numbers to JP Morgan and saying, can you help me refi this loan? They re, JP Morgan looks at the numbers and they say, can you explain to us this operating income assumption? And that's, you're using that word a lot. So that's why I'm asking you this question. You're using this assumption and they say, yes, this is, this is taking out the COVID years because that was a one-time event. And but the expectation is that you'll never have that again and that basically we can take out all the negatives. So his point is that when we look at the deal, we have no idea the validity of the income itself, even looking back because the operator has adjusted for emergency one-time events and pandemic response and pandemic forgiveness and all that kind of stuff. And so they're basically asking the client to pony up more equity. Does that, is that relating to what you are also seeing here on the operating income projection side? Yes. A lot of it, especially for the office sector is based on, you know, are people going to come back to work and to what degree? So some of the, some of the research on that end has shown that, you know, people have gone from a, uh, from a hybrid model, work from home, work from the office, where that's at least one day a week working from home to a full work from home, uh, set up where, you know, you don't even have an office. So the question is what, what does that really look like today? While COVID was a one-time uh, one-time event, it has substantially shifted, you know, the ground that everybody stands upon, especially for um, the office sector. For the multifamily sector, the issue is, well, we know that so many people have moved around and we know that demand went up, you know, so much, for example, like in Phoenix, rents went up almost 30% over that two-year period of time. Now there's huge, huge amounts of new inventory that's being built that'll come online, you know, this year and the next. Uh, nationally, it's just under a million new rental units. In Phoenix, it's 50,000. I mean, these are huge numbers. It's almost, uh, there's more than twice what the you know annual average is for uh, new apartment products. So how do you trust the numbers when you know that all of these things have happened? Um, to be frank, you, you can't. You have to perform the best that you know. And, you know, I don't know about going back and, you know, doing a, what I guess what you call in a footnote, a COVID adjustment for what you expected, you know, annual rents or operations to be during that time. Um, that would be a tough sell. If you're, you know, your buddy at JP Morgan and you saw something and I saw something like that, I'd be like, oh boy, you know, here we go. Here's, here's one of the footnotes in the report that, you know, probably should have been two pages itself. So um, when it comes down to it, it's like, yes, that's this. We have no idea what's going on. We can't trust these numbers. And now we need to refinance the debt at even more expense when rents are coming down and we don't trust the numbers. So, yes, in that situation, you know, saying, hey, you, you've got to pony up some money because we we can't even make sense of this. And therefore, you know, if we're if we're not going to do it, then, you know, what what are you going to do becomes the real question. So right. um, I, I would agree with that assessment and I find that to be particularly valid just because you can't, you know, everybody is basically looking around and saying, what, what is everybody else doing and how are they doing it? Um, and in that case, it's, it's like, well, we're all trying to figure out what the real numbers are and what they should be. And if you're the bank, it's like, well, can we even trust these numbers? And, you know, the safest thing to do is to say, sorry, you got to pony up more equity in order to, to refinance or stay in this loan. Otherwise you've got to try and sell. And then, you know, you coming up with a shortfall, if you don't sell for the, the, the outstanding debt, that becomes the equity holders problem. 
Okay, so let's talk about first. I want to do office, then we're going to get into multifamily. Sure. And we're definitely going to talk about Taiwan Semiconductor as we go. Um, so first on office, let's bring up this chart, chart number three. This is the office vacancy rate. We see it rising. Now, the data isn't great. This is something that you've mentioned as well. We don't have a great insight as to the true vacancy rate, but you know we have some data series. I, this one, I believe, might be taken from Moody's that you have here. Um, they seem to have one of the most consistent data points here on office vacancy. So I want to ask you about what you mentioned with some of these fire sales, buildings going for $2 a square foot and the numbers you you're suggesting don't tell the full story, but part of the story. So are you seeing in Arizona, any of these types of fire sales? You mentioned one project written down from 160 last sale price to 112 million. That's a qu quite a large write down, but, are you seeing any other fire sales and are you seeing good data on office vacancy rates other than say a generic Moody's number that uh, you have on the screen? So to, to answer the question briefly, uh, no. So the, the office vacancy rate uh, here in chart three is from uh, the Wall Street Journal a couple of weeks ago. To give context, the, the first large spike up to about 20%, that was from 1986. The second one was 1991, and then uh, the third and fourth were 2003 and 2010. So you kind of see in relation to the events happening in those time frames where we are today, knowing that we don't have really good data. So as far as the fire sales go, the, the project I had mentioned was just multifamily. I haven't seen any office related um, deals get sold at just you know, silly, you know, single digit numbers. A lot of the things that have happened in Phoenix have been off market or been part of a portfolio that was national where, you know, it may have been 20% uh, of the build, you know, the estimated cost to build it. So if it sells for, uh, or if it takes a hundred bucks to build it, you know, they may sell for somewhere between 40 or 20 and $40. Uh, dollars. Now that's, that's about as good as it's going to get. It hasn't been plastered all over the news to, you know, to use that parlance, but it is occurring, just not as not as um, fire sale ish as you would see. You know, if, if something was selling, I think there was a building in St. Louis that sold for four dollars a square foot the other day. You know, or in Detroit where um, Dan Gilbert, uh, his real estate portfolio has just taken an absolute beating by some of the fire sales that are going on there. So you know, you're not really seeing that quite yet, but. What you are seeing is uh, buildings being sold at the level of the debt. So everybody's kind of eking out by the edge of their their teeth. And, um, you know, a lot of this stuff just isn't in public. A lot of the things, a lot of the projects that I've seen sell are projects where I went and looked up, you know, the recorded debt itself. And then, you know, looked at the, the two sentence newswire on whatever site it was or the conversations that I have. So it's just based on my personal ver verification of looking up, you know, what the recorded deed of trust is. So um, it's uh, it's quite interesting in that regard. Will we see um, what the true vacancy is as time goes on? I expect so. I expect that um, the price discovery will occur based on the knowledge of who is walking away from their leases, who's not renewing, uh, who stopped payment. Um, and who's basically trying to negotiate to or renegotiate to stay where they're at. So, you know, that's that's basically one of those things where you don't find out until you find out. Um, there's not going to be a whole lot of information just because it's usually privately held. Um, the only way that you would get a good idea is basically to follow like an office, uh, an office REIT or another sort of real estate trust that has large portfolios where they, you know, have to disclose this stuff to investors where they anticipate you know, loan losses on lease exceeding, you know, five, 10% of, you know, their, their operating budgets. So, you know, that's, that's really, that's really the only way you're going to find out is when they have to publish it. And we are tracking loan loss reserves at the national level per federal reserve data. That's the H.8 report. And 
uh, at the Bitcoin layer, we suggest you guys at home go subscribe the Bitcoin slash subscribe for our research publication so that you can. Yes. And of course, go check out layered money as well uh, so that you can stay up to date on all of these metrics that we are watching. And we are watching loan loss reserves very, very closely because it has a relationship with the ability of these banks to realize the losses, right? The loan loss reserves are in advance of the realized losses and the realized losses are only palatable for the shareholders if reserves are taken out in advance. So they have to make those indications to the market that there are losses on the horizon. It's something that we have to be watching extremely closely this year with, especially with regional banks. We're not going to ask Kelly to name which bank he thinks is going to go under next because of specific real estate exposure in Arizona. Uh, but I want to ask you now about multifamily. There are a couple different dynamics that I want that I, I was thinking about as you were discussing. One is that if projects are not able to be completed due to lack of financing and cement costs, as you know, you and I discussed, things of that nature, then it should suggest that, okay, we're going to have less supply onto the market in the future, and that could be inflationary. On the other side, you tell us that there's a million units coming online, 50,000 in Phoenix specifically, and so that could result in oversupply and rent, no, rent prices declining. So which is it that is going to win out and what is your outlook there? And, you know, you can have a hedged answer, but we we're curious what you're thinking in terms of the prices of rents themselves based on these two dynamics in multifamily specifically. And I'm going to have the chart up here on um, multifamily refinancing debt as well. You can you can get into that, but answer the question first, please. Sure. So. Uh, I think that the the answer can be split up into short term, medium term, long term. Short term, um, rents will continue to decline as new product comes to the market. That's just there's no other way to do it. There's no huge uh, uh, transcontinental movements of people across the way to fill in the demand. That that phase is over. Um, but because of that, these huge new gluts of supply are coming online. Now you have to remember in the real estate business, everything is delayed. Even if, you know, on day one of COVID that there was going to be a hundred thousand people moving to Phoenix, it would still take you somewhere between 18 to 24 months to build the apartments for those people. That's just the nature of the business. So in the short term, next couple of years, it's going to be uh, rents declining, supply up, vacancies up, all of these other things. But because of that delayed nature of the product, Beyond that, that's where you're going to see things first level off. And then once again, uh, rents will start to climb because there's no new product coming online. So when you have um, basically a, a, a rental product that you have to get approvals for, you have to build, you have to go all through all of these steps. It could take you four to five, maybe even six years before that product becomes available for rent. Um, so you have a situation where there's just unbelievable amounts of supply hitting the market in the next two years, it's going to have to be digested. And then after that, there's no new supply coming online. I think uh, uh, some of the information I saw was that there's a 60 to 80% drop in forthcoming new supply based on uh, current trends in planning and development across the country. So I can definitely attest for that locally where projects are shelved or ready to go when it would still take two years um, to do or that uh, essentially business as usual has stopped. There's no new um, projects that are entering, you know, planning departments to be built even in four or five years. So in my, in my opinion, you know, the short term is that rents are going down, supply is going up there. Even if the Fed brings down rates sufficiently, they're still going to be uh, paying on operator balance sheets just because. And, um, you know, it's going to probably take five to six years for this to resolve where rents start to tick back up um, and relieve some pressure on operating statements. So that's that's kind of what I'm looking at. That's what I'm planning for. And, um, you know, I hope that uh, I hope that that works out for everybody. And the corollary is it, it's a direct one is going to be as rents decline, the realized 
uh, operating income declines, the loan loss provisions will increase. That is going to be essentially a one for one, a healthy banking practice and something that we're going to be looking for. So Kelly, the arm debt in multifamily here, tell us what we're looking at in charts four and five, please. So these charts are from uh, Credit IQ, fantastic work. And what they show is the origination in chart four is the origination dates of loans coming uh, due in 2024 and 2025. You can see the huge spike I mentioned earlier that 80 billion of the loans coming due were made in 2021. And you can see right there that that's where that's coming from. So these are people that entered the market a lot of times, um, not necessarily unsophisticated investors, but less sophisticated investors jumping into uh, multifamily real estate, um, particularly through the uh, the affordances in the Jobs Act, where you know um, investors can pool their money and buy things. So what we're also looking at is a huge spike in 2014 and 2015, relatively, and that's more of your standard commercial debt. That's a 10-year deal coming due uh, this year and the next, and you know at the the rates that those were done at you have to wonder, okay, are these people going to sell? Has there been enough appreciation in the last 10 years where these people can kind of sell and go away and not have to worry about refinancing? Um, in chart five, this is where you kind of get into the dangers of adjustable rate mortgages, especially for CRE debt. Um, what we saw in 2021, uh, at least locally, was that a lot of people were taking the two or three year arms at the teaser rate. And now that their loans are becoming fully amortizing, that they just can't afford the payments. So uh, when your loan is between four and 5%, that's about 29% of all of the loans and you've got to reprice it to six, seven or 8%, you know, that that's a huge swing. Remember when we talk about cap rates, that the expectation of the income is not nearly as of the rental income is not nearly as important in the deal as the expected appreciation of the property itself, at least in a financial sense. So they're hoping to buy something at a five cap and sell it at a four cap. And, you know, the only way you can afford to do that is that if your debt is cheaper than the cap itself. So in this case, you've got a lot of people that are basically in hot water saying, OK, how do I go from uh, my four and a quarter interest payment to six, seven, eight? Um, and that's, you know, that that's where. The banking conversation comes in. Can we trust these numbers? Uh, are we just going to require them to put up more equity? Or uh, from the operator position, it's can I even get more equity and do I just need to sell? And if I sell, can I pay the debt? So um, there's a host of factors on top of this, as we discussed with the rents and the demands and the supply. You know, it's almost an awful, awful maelstrom of things going on where you have to kind of pick. Uh, you have to pick which you think you can survive. Um, can you survive your rates going up as well as your operating income going down? Or, you know, do you just need to sell? Um, that's, that's kind of what these charts show. This is a, it's a tough, it's a tough position to be in, especially for the people that were basically jumped in and got involved in 2021 where multifamily or just real estate in general, especially residential real estate had massive, massive, gains, um, especially for the equity holders that were in place before then. And, um, you know, I, I fortunately, I, I'm not in this position where I have to make this decision, but I, I have seen a lot of projects and properties and underwritten a lot of existing deals that definitely are. Um, and uh, like I said, a lot of them have just chosen to sell and move on. Um, but I expect that as more product comes online, that that will become a more difficult or even an uh, infeasible option. So lots of trouble brewing. And I want to relate it to what something that we talked about last week at the Bitcoin layer, which is the enormous ability, or let's say the outsized ability of large investment grade corporations and even large junk debt grade corporations to roll their debt in these first two months of 2024. January and February, record numbers on investment grade issuance outside of the pandemic, high yield borrowers, a large chunk of, of next year's maturity wall now kicked out several years, even at these higher interest rates. So the ability of 
the large corporations to refi is a different story than what we are seeing with the real estate projects where it's difficult to refi because it is going on at a much more small level with less diversification and more concentration and just more risk of these banks and the small banks themselves. This is something that we should note here. It's the smaller banks that have the exposure to the smaller real estate projects. And so those loans are very difficult for the bank to refi right now, just given where operating income and, and the interest rates are, the lack of ability potentially of the borrowers to put up more equity. Kelly, um, two more things that I wanna do first. Manufactured housing, and then we're gonna get to Taiwan Semiconductor. Let's talk about, just quickly for me, explain this this new wave of manufactured housing that we you and I have discussed and how you think it plays into the bigger idea of residential real estate prices is there a trade off there that is a secular trend we should be thinking about for the next decade to come and maybe even if you can just relate it to this idea that real estate isn't nearly as scarce as something like bitcoin because of the theoretically unlimited supply response of real estate to to build up and that is of course uh in contrast with um zoning regulations and and things of that sort so i know that's a bunch of questions but curious your thoughts so from what we're seeing on the manufactured home side and the modular home side i'll explain the difference the manufactured home is is kind of what you think of when you see uh, a trailer home. A modular home is where they build the home in segments and then bring it to the job site and assemble the whole trailer, or excuse me, assemble the whole home. So um, you can get, you know, multiple manufactured units and put them together. You know, that would be the equivalent of like a double wide um, or, um, you know, they can do three or four now. But the idea is that because of the expense of an, a site built, project like a when you drive around town you see people putting in together you know constructing a building that'd be a site build project because of the expense that builders and developers face now the idea is okay where can we go to still provide product and essentially if you can't do it on site you have to do it off site so that's where um some focus has been shifting we've been uh uh, very uh, serious about looking at it to see if that's a, an avenue where we can provide essentially shelter for people who are willing to pay for it. Um, so, you know, this isn't, uh, this isn't your grandpa's trailer. This isn't, you know, trailer park boys. This is a totally different product where if you, you know, tour these things, they're really not any different than, you know, a B class apartment. All the interior finishes are the same. All of the quality of the work is the same or better just because it's in a controlled environment and the same people are doing the same job over and over again. So there's a very interesting contrast, I guess, if you if you want to incorporate, you know, Bitcoin in the sense of, OK, if we have an expanding monetary base and we know that it's likely to continue expanding, what that does is it affects uh, the market's ability to coordinate and to do things. So if we can reduce the timeline from 18 to 24 months to on a site built project to four to five months for an offsite built product, then we're, you know, we're in a good position to where we can perform a market function and get in and out without essentially getting smacked upside the head by some sort of monetary uh, expansion along the way that just you can't account for. Um, so that's a serious contender, um, for providing new product going forward because it's, it's, you know, I don't want to say it's cheap and fast, but it's cheaper and much faster than a site built project. It's not the same amount of control. You're very limited in, you know, the things that you can do where you can put it as far as the zoning goes. But we, um, our opinion is that when push comes to shove, that cities realizing that they don't have anywhere for people to live are going to ease up on some of their restrictions, especially with a lot of the stigma, uh, at least in our opinion, the stigma of manufactured housing and modular housing uh, being evaded over time, just because of the quality of the build 
uh, has improved so much. So when we move from something like real estate, where, you know, in a marketplace, when demand increases, supply can meet it. Or if demand decreases, supply basically adjusts in price to where it tries to entice people to use it. So with Bitcoin, we have the exact opposite where there will only ever be 21 million. And when demand uh, increases, as we've seen lately in the last month, basically there is no new supply. The supply is there, it's the supply, and the price must go up to, to match and at least to curtail further demand. In real estate, you know, I can build a one story building, I can build a single, a single home, or I can build you know, a hundred story tower in New York City that's got thousands of units. So you're not limited necessarily in your ability to respond to demand. That's another case where, um, while real estate has probably been the favorite store of value for the last 50-ish 50, 50 years, uh, we, we see that reversing just because there is now an asset which does not basically depend on uh, what people would call a Wittgenstein ruler, where um, you're trying to measure something where the measurement itself changes over time. So there's no standard of standard of value, so to speak. So, you know, when we're in a position like today where there is a severe shortage of housing, even with a million units coming online, remember this is just distributed nationally. There's still so many people that uh, don't have their own form of shelter or where they're splitting it with multiple roommates. There was a Pew Research study done, I believe it was uh, 2022, where even before the uh, before COVID, approximately 28% of millennials still lived at home. So, you know, the millennial cohort itself is about 82 or 83 million people. So think about that. Almost 30% of that entire population still lives at home. We couldn't, even if we built a, a million units a year, I think the average is 1.1 million residential units a year. You, you still couldn't, you couldn't build your way out of the problem in two decades. So what we're seeing now is huge, uh, huge trends, at least in local planning and development and the abolition of essentially single family zoning, um, building what are called ADUs, accessory dwelling units. It's basically a house in your backyard, small house in your backyard, like a casita. Um, and there, there's lots of groundswell to reduce the, um, basically reduce the city's grip on people's ability to build shelter. Now that's not necessarily, it's, it's from both ends. It's from, you know, mom and pop building something in their backyard for their kid or for whoever, you know, maybe even an Airbnb all the way up to, you know, the investment house is saying like, Hey, you know, I've got this project. I need to build 500 units and um, you're only letting me do 200. You know, this site can support 500. We've done all the math. Here it is. Here's the parking. It's going to cost us a little bit more. We can make it work. But cities and especially planning staff are basically turning it down for not meeting specific, you know, code requirements, local code requirements. Uh, we have a project ourselves that we're working on that we've basically had to reduce the unit quantity by uh, just over 25% just because the code says it doesn't work. So there's very, and this is in a, uh, you know, this is in central Phoenix. This is not on the edge of town. It's a very hard corner. You know, it's a major arterial and a freeway. And we're being told that, you know, no, we can't, we can't do that. That's too dense for that area. So there's a lot of pushback um, to creating new supply that just, it just needs to be done. So when you contrast that again to Bitcoin, there's lots of, there's lots of, hands, so to speak, in the pie when it comes to building new, um, new buildings in general, not just, not just multifamily, but multifamily is a hot button issue just because of COVID era, all the movement, all the building that happened. Um, so we, we think, um, that a lot of the restrictive zoning and code will be abated. There are, uh, movements such as like new urbanism. There's actually, um, two attorneys, uh, posted a paper about the constitutional case against exclusionary zoning, which is basically, you know, fantastic and has been unheard of. Um, the Supreme Court case that decided that was from 19, I think it was 1929. So there hasn't really been any challenges to any of this stuff. But now that there's nowhere for anyone to live, now everybody's wondering, well, why, why is that? Um, 
So we think that that's a positive development. We think that a lot of the a lot of the code and a lot of the existing infrastructure that exists that you have to go through, the processes that you have to go through are basically a result of a fiat standard and not necessarily the result of uh, uh, a restrictive monetary supply. So um, I think uh, hopefully I, I answered all of the questions at least partially in order and partially together. But if I missed something, happy to continue. No, that, that was an, a fantastic answer and tremendous insight. And it's why we brought Kelly on because he's a very long-term thinker and suggesting at right there in that response, several long-term secular trends at hand that we should be thinking about general supply of housing, the legal justification for less zoning restrictions and other matters of that day. And then of course the dynamic between manufactured or modular housing and current residential real estate and the way it's zoned and the dynamic between those two, how one market might affect the other. These are all long-term trends that we'll keep thinking about. Now, Kelly, talk to us briefly about Taiwan Semiconductor coming into Arizona. What are the implications for for you and your business from an Arizona real estate perspective, but then maybe also just from a, a national and semiconductor perspective, any insights you have there, please? Sure. So uh, Taiwan Semiconductor um, has been selected uh, Phoenix, Arizona to be one of their new plants uh, back in 2020. Um, and they were going to bring their four nanometer chip fab, uh, fabrication is the short for fab, uh, factory uh, here in town. Now, most people may not know this, but Phoenix has been a long time chip fab hotspot. Uh, Intel has four active plants in southeastern Phoenix in a town called Chandler, Arizona, and they have been here for uh, over 20 years. So they recently announced uh, two more chip factories, chip fabs, that are going to be built in Chandler. But uh, Taiwan Semiconductor is basically all the rage. So they produce a different product than Intel. But uh, it's a very, very high demand product for uh, mobile phones, other small devices, et cetera. Um, so they came in 2020 and they basically said, we are going to build a huge fab. Uh, it's, I think it approximately is about $20 billion, which is twice the cost of what an average Intel fab is. Um, Phoenix is great for that because we have a, a nuclear power plant, the Palo Verde power plant. And contrary to uh, what the news media would have you believe, um, we have way more water than uh, is publicly acceptable or known, so to speak. So it's a fantastic location for such uh, a, uh, uh, basically a manufacturing plant. And that uh, in 2020, they, <laughs> they decided that they wanted to build the plant as fast as possible. There's a lot of geopolitical risk for Taiwan and for TSMC. They, they have diversified some of their fabs to uh, Japan, and I believe uh, there's they're selecting one other location, possibly in Washington. But um, the idea is that they know that there is possibly a risk of them staying there. So they're trying to get out as fast as possible. Now, the issue when it comes to construction and especially a complex, a complex endeavor like a fab is that you can't really blow and go and not screw something up. So. Um, in 2020, things were okay. And then in 2022, uh, around the time the CHIPS Act got passed, where federal funds were being allocated to manufacturers, um, they announced a second fab. Now, mind you, they were already probably a third complete with the existing fab, and they had to go back and essentially retool the entire infrastructure in the building to support the second fab. So now it's up to uh, two fabs with talks of you know three, four, five, whatever whatever you believe, but um, the the cost of the buildings is expected to be about 40 billion. Now, based on some of the insight I have being a local and having uh, direct knowledge of people who work there, um, to say that it's a cluster would be being very generous. So when you were building um, a chip fab, especially you were worried about small movements, essentially literally in the earth for manufacturing such small wafers. Um, so Arizona is a good place for that. We don't have really any earthquakes. Um, but in order to do that, you have to pour 
tons and tons and tons of concrete. So we have a project that's actually, I guess as the crow flies, maybe eight or 10 miles away uh, from the project. And unfortunately we had to pour our building slabs at the same time as uh, TSMC was pouring the additional concrete for their new, uh, for their second fab. So uh, there's, you could watch the news on a daily basis and you could see all of the concrete trucks lined up along the freeway in order to access the site. And it ended up being that we had to pay four times what we originally contracted the concrete for. And mind you, this is, you know, 10,000 square feet of slab. This is not, not anything crazy. But if you're over there on a thousand acre, you know, project, you know, you're pouring acres of concrete at a time that may in some cases be up to four feet thick. So for, for probably a year, it was incredibly difficult to get uh, a base of goods such as concrete. Now there, <laughs> there are stories and we discuss them, but um, you know, the only way to get concrete at the time was to take uh, concrete dispatchers to lunch and offer them essentially unmarked envelopes. And that's really what it came down to for people to get concrete, just because TSMC was so set or is still so set on building their fabs as quickly as possible and getting operational as quickly as possible to reduce you know, geopolitical risk and essentially their company's survival that they did not, they, they still, even to this day, don't really care. They're buying up whatever they can. Uh, there's lots of lots of stories, lots of true stories about um, U.S. workers or project managers or foremen being poached uh, by um, essentially TSMC corporate in order to uh, manage their own crews. So people may not be familiar. There's approximately 500 workers that were brought from Taiwan directly to Arizona, essentially or, in order to do round the clock shifts in order to construct the fabs. Now, the problem with that is that TSMC workers in Taiwan build on different codes or knowledge or processes than they do here in the U.S. So there is some union involvement on the job out there. Uh, Arizona is a right to work state, but there are still some unions and um, it's caused quite an issue. I guess one of the you could say an unspoken rule on a project is that you do not take my workers or my staff while the project is ongoing. So uh, I know for a fact that there's been probably a dozen uh, subcontractors that have walked off the job because their people are getting poached. So if TSMC is taking these people so that they can build it, now the subcontractors are in Dutch because they've lost some of their best people and they can't essentially continue. So there's a lot of, I guess, underhanded things that are kind of going on that, in my opinion, it's going to make it very difficult for the plant to actually flip the switch, um, especially when you have cross-cultural issues. You have actual literal construction differences between, you know, the way one crew works and then, the you know, if the morning American crew shows up and the nighttime Taiwanese crew does something different, you know, how do you build on top of that? You know, that, that's the question. The other issue is a lot of times these guys are just being handed engineering schematics as opposed to actual plans. So for those uh, who are, who may not know, you know, when you build something, you have a full plan set that tells you where everything's going, how everything interacts, where things are layered on top of each other, how, you know, if you need to keep separation. But imagine that if you just have, you know, an eight by 11 sheet of paper with a detail saying, this is how you build this segment without any overlay or concern for the other segments of whatever piping or steel beams that may be in your way. So things are being ripped out and replaced four or five, six times. Um, I have a, a, a close contact who's remove and replace, you know, a couple, the same couple miles of pipeline multiple times. So, um, you know, that gets really hard to, really hard to control, especially in construction sense, because, you know, when you think about construction, you have to think about it essentially in layers. If you get up, you know, if you start at the base layer and that's, let's say you're pouring your concrete slab, but then, you know, you get four or five layers up to where you put the drywall on. Well, if something's wrong at layer three with some of the piping behind the wall, you've got to remove the wall and you're going to affect all the other layers in between. So 
uh, if there's one thing I know in construction is that to go back and fix something that's already been covered up is quite literally one of the most expensive things on the job. So, you know, is 40 billion going to be the final price target? I don't think so. I think it's going to be a boondoggle, probably 50% more than that, just to, you know, flip on the lights. So, um, it's been a very interesting, um, dynamic watching a corporation that knows it has to get out of town. They're trying to build it as fast as possible. It's not meeting the schedule because it's you, you, some of these complex things, you know, when you build, you just can't rush like that because mistakes are going to get made. Um, and I, I like to say that the people that the people that plan it and the people that design it are not the same people building it. So you've got lots of different uh, understandings of what should be done, how it should be done, how it actually can be done. Um, you know, plan bus are, are part of the nature of construction. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting to watch. I'm glad that I'm not in that business or participating in it. I know lots of people that have walked away, but, uh, you know, for the, for the sake of the amount of jobs that they bring to the Valley, which is, uh, approximately, I think it was estimated around 4,500 people, you know, that's, that's a good thing. Having high paying manufacturing jobs, especially, you know, for something like uh, uh, chips is, is a good thing. So hopefully they get it settled, get it, uh, get it done. But um, it has certainly affected everybody's ability locally to, um, to do projects just because there's so much demand for workforce. I think at one, at the maximum workforce there, uh, at a time over the course of one month was 25,000 people. So, you know, this is not, you know, this is not some simple deal. This is not, you know, where there's like four or five, maybe even a thousand people to manage on a daily basis. These are, you know, upwards of tens of thousands of people working in the same area. Kelly Landon, thank you so much for joining us today at the Bitcoin layer. Please give the audience where they can read your writing about Bitcoin. Well, thank you, Nick. I appreciate that uh, you had me on. You guys can find me on Twitter at K-T-L-A-N-N-A-N. That's my personal account. And then the Bitcoin Urbanism account is just at Bitcoin Urbanism. And then you can find me at BitcoinUrbanism.substack.com. Great. We'll catch you guys next time. The Bitcoin Layer is proud to be sponsored by River. Go check them out at river.com slash TBL for a special offer of up to $100 worth of Bitcoin for free. Now, River is an amazing Bitcoin-only exchange that offers Lightning Network withdrawals and deposits. They offer zero-fee recurring orders and a really cool new feature that allows you to text Bitcoin to your friends and family. Go check them out, river.com slash TBL.